Welcome to How Not to DM. I'm your host, Derek. Thanks for joining me on my quest to interview the very best dungeon masters on this plane of existence. Now let's get to this show's guest, Ty, the DM of Side Character Quest. His show is unique among actual play podcasts because it features many different guests playing the roles of side characters in his world, and each game is a self-contained story and played with one DM and one player. Ty has been a great friend to me personally as well, giving me podcast advice as I had questions because he's been at this much longer than me. If you're an aspiring podcaster or DM, there's bound to be something he says that resonates with you. Enjoy. The first time I ever played D&D, I played with my brother when I was like, 12 or something don't remember what edition it was but based on the time period probably third edition and i don't even know if we played for 10 minutes 20 minutes but a older brother younger brother dynamic does not work for (laughs) for dungeons and dragons it didn't well not for us at least especially that young yeah especially that young Uh, there's other people Mm -hmm. out there that i'm sure could do it but uh I didn't get into it again until years later when uh, my buddy Eli let me know that he and a bunch of his friends were going to be getting together um, to play a round of fourth edition. And I arrived and there were like eight people, something like that. We all got together around a table and it was a blast. Eight people's a lot of people. (laughs) It's it's a lot of folks to all have at the same table. A bunch of newbies. Uh, We ended up. And they they had the ru- uh, rules printed up and like put them on the wall of the uh, of the dorm. It was great. <laughs> was Eli the DM? I believe he was the DM for the first first one. He definitely was the DM for the first like long campaign that we did. Eli is probably the most influential person on me about DMing, just because I have played under him more than like anybody else. He's he's a good guy. When did you decide you were going to take the step behind the screen? I think right around the time that Eli was wrapping up maybe his first or second, he probably he probably was like, listen, guys, if we're going to keep doing this, somebody else has to step it up. And so I was like, I think I'm going to do this. I I, I came up with some fun ideas that were really dumb. (laughs) And I, I thought that I had made this very like open world thing because everything we were doing was like very like linear and it was very combat focused i don't know if you ever played 4e but it's it's very like board game-esque i'm sure there's people that do it in a role-playing way but you know yeah. that wasn't how we played it at the time and I, I would go through just a series of little encounters that were all just like very battle map army space stuff and then at the end of it i would say all right and now you see a path and one way leads to mountains and the other way leads to swamps. And I would just say, all right, whatever they choose, that's the chance for them to choose what we're going to be doing next. But it was, it was so (laughs) amateurish, (laughs) but yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. The fact that you were even giving them some choices is a big step (laughs) compared to, you know, a lot of people's first experience running a game themselves. So I think you were ahead of your time, Ty. (laughs) <laughs> that's very generous and i'll take it <laughs> all right how many years have you been running games and what editions have you run what other games have you run uh, other than D? it's hard to say the number of games a lot of the folks that i've i've heard on this show specifically are people that are talking about doing like you know oh i i run three games a week you know i've been running since i was you know 10 years old I, i've been doing whatever i i've been DMing since probably 2013, 2012. But there are times when I would go five months between games and I I don't remember ever DMing two weeks in a row. We were we were never going super, super regularly. As far as like the different systems that I've used, I've DMed D&D 4E, D&D 5E, which is probably where I have most of my experience, not probably, definitely 100% where I have most of my experience. I've DM'd a couple of uh, disastrous games of Monster of the Week. I'm really bad at running Powered by the Apocalypse style games. Don't know why. Love playing them. Cannot handle the responsibility of running them. 
Uh, <laughs> I've played a couple games of Lasers and Feelings, Force and Destiny, and also uh, I played a GM-less game called Fiasco, which was so much fun. I don't know if you've ever heard of Fiasco, but it's it's basically this game that like breaks up, takes like a movie genre and takes you through the course of a movie in like two or three hours, entire story. And the way it's built, just it feels like magic at the end, like when everything comes together. It's like, how how, how did this happen? So, Ty, you have been DMing for a while now, run a few different kinds of games. So you must have some good answers to this question. And that is, what are some of the worst mistakes you remember making, problems that you caused, that kind of thing while running games? And what lessons did you learn from it? What lessons can listeners take away from it too? There was a time when um, I was introducing uh, some players to a person that I thought was going to be a, a really fun recurring villain. And I was like, this, this is going to be somebody that they're going to see all the time. And as we were, we were playing, I realized that my players were just wrecking them. They were just destroying this person. I was like, oh, no. Well, I'll say that as an action this turn, they pull out a health potion and take a swig of it. My players saw straight through me and knew immediately, this guy didn't have a health potion. And this guy had just healed himself back up to full health. He didn't have that ability. I, that was just something I came up with on, on the fly. And I know there's lots of people, you know, that have been on the show, uh, lots of great DMs, great DMs, who will say, just just roll with it. Just do it behind, you know, behind the screen. I can't. If I decide on something in advance, I have to stick through, uh, to it because my players see through me instantly. So after, after that happened, I apologized to them for the stupid ploy that I tried. And um, I think that that gives me credibility when there are things that I don't help them with. When, when there are things that I do that seem unfair, they know that it's okay that I'm not pulling punches. Because I also don't purposefully mess them up. There was a there was a recent uh, episode of SCQ uh, um, of the podcast that I do. I'm not going to spoil what happens for listeners, but so at the end of the arc, one of the players gets caught in a kind of sticky situation, and they never questioned was I being unfair because I had set up the fact that these rules are consistent, that I have a world that they're working within. And I'm not just going to make this terrible thing happen because I think it would be interesting or fun for the story. And so it, it felt fair to them that this was going to happen. And the reality is that that thing, that bad thing that happened to them, I had put into place specifically as a tool to help them, but they hadn't discovered it. And so one of the bad guys had ended up taking advantage of it. I am really working hard to avoid <laughs> spoiling some major stuff. So uh, I apologize for my vagueness. Yeah, I think that's a good explanation, but that makes a lot of sense. And honestly, in the process of talking to lots of people, I used to be team just make whatever happen because it's behind the screen. Your players will never know. But I feel like I have definitely shifted a lot more towards your line of thinking in that if you make the world fair for the players and against the players, they're never going to question, oh, did he pull punches there and did we not actually have a chance? Or, oh, did he intentionally kill my character off for X, Y, and Z reasons, right? You know, I think that there's a lot to be said for keeping things even and fair in that way. And then they never have to question whether or not you're doing things specifically for or against them. Exactly. I, I so often have situations where my players plow through bad guys because I am not making the world at a level to give them a challenge. I'm making the world at the level that this world would be. And that way, I feel that they can go in with appropriate expectations. And I, I know that's not everybody's play style, and that's totally, totally fine. Different games for different people. And I feel like I should just have said that at the very beginning because all of my answers to every question will be different people, 
different different play styles, different worlds. You're you're having a great time. You're you're doing it right. Yeah, I guess you could just turn this off because that'll be his answer for the rest <laughs> yeah, of the questions. There it is. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to try not to give a million caveats to every answer here on out. Okay, we'll we'll just keep that one in mind. All right. What are some of your favorite memories of improvisation, role playing, that kind of thing from your games? It could be the show. It could be a game other than the show, but ones that really stick out in your mind just because of how fun and interesting and awesome they were in the moment. There was a a moment in a game that I was playing with my my friend Eli, my friend Mallory, my friend Daryl. Uh, we were playing a Force and Destiny game. I know nothing about Star Wars. All of them are huge fans. And we did a game once, a session once, that was just one of those classic shopping sessions. And it just ended up being so fun. Eli, the DM, had just planned on this being like a, you know, hop in, buy some stuff, we'll wrap up, we'll head out. But it ended up evolving because he he just took the moment to grab anything that anybody was latching on to and finding interesting and expanding it. And it ended up turning into chase scenes, into heists, into all of these crazy things. And we ended up leaving with my character having a fancy new outfit and the whole crew having a fancy new spaceship. And that was not something that was ever planned. There was no way that Eli (laughs) knew that was going to be happening from the beginning. But he just rolled with what we were finding interesting in that moment and made such a great fun experience out of something that could have been very simple you know eli was your first dm he's the one you've played with the most you mentioned but as far as influences on your dming style who do you feel like you have taken the most from when you it comes to your own games and, you know, what what things did you or have you learned from all of these different people that have ultimately led to you being the DM you are today? Obviously, you know, I, I mentioned Eli before, uh, obviously a big influence on me. But there's a few other thing, a few other people that I should probably shout out. Probably the show that I have the closest feel to as far as pacing and uh, world building, all that stuff is um, Sneak Attack, which is run by uh, Reed, uh, who is somebody that I think has been mentioned a few times on the show. Um, I've learned a lot about what I enjoy in DMing from listening to Reed and then later uh, Josh with Titans of Altera. And and I've also learned what sort of things I don't like because there's a lot of ways that they build worlds very intricately and very pre-planned that I just don't I don't have the mind for pre-planned is is the wrong word I definitely do a lot of pre-planning but but there's a lot of detail that they put in that I do differently not less but differently there's also the adventure zone um Griffin McElroy the first time that I heard a show um because I started listening to this before sneak attack where I was like oh this is the sort of like fun table dynamic that i want to hear in a in a show in an actual play show i have a couple other answers uh that are a little bit off the normal uh what you would normally expect when i was starting to make side character quest i was reading tons of books in the cosmere brandon sanderson i don't know if you're aware of um, that fantasy writer he has a style of building worlds and systems in his worlds very very slowly eventually getting to a point where when you realize how the world works you care how the world works because you already care about the characters that is a thing that i think about when i'm dming and when i'm making side character quest a lot i don't feel that people care as much about fantasy worlds and about fiction in general in absence of characters that they care about if i was to tell a stranger every detail of how my fantasy world works i think there would be nothing more boring uh (laughs) but if i got them to fall in love with the characters first then oh they really want to know every detail about why sending magic doesn't work in certain locations (laughs) and then i I have one one final influence that i'd like to point out there or throw out there Pride and Prejudice, the movie starring Kira Knightley. 
classic. I watched this January of last year, and the opening sequence of that movie is so incredibly good because you see this this wide open field and then this just lone woman walking reading a book and then it like it shows you this this space you hear you hear the sounds you get a vibe for what the season is like the time of day and then it zooms in and shows you like the the paper that she's reading and you get a feel for like what is the quality of craftsmanship of this location and then it zooms back out and you see her walking approaching this building that's a very large building but then there's people dealing with ducks and chickens and stuff and then you're hearing this beautiful piano music playing the whole time and then the camera swings over and you see uh, there's a, a one of her sisters is playing the piano and the way that all of these details are thrown in just piece by piece to paint this scene for you is so masterful. And I wish I had seen it years ago because I, I feel like it is it is such a good way to approach introducing any new scene, any new space when you're DMing. I love it. It's very good. Your current project is called Side Character Quest. So first of all, why is it called Side Character Quest? This is an example of me coming up with a name that's too clever for its own good. <laughs> it is side characters going on side quests is the basic idea. So the stories that we see are about the less important people doing things that are not even necessarily the most important thing that they will ever do. That is the, the sort of starting premise for the show. There's an ethos that I l try to put through the show, which is that every person matters, even when they're doing small, mundane things. And just, just as an example, the first character that, that we meet, it, he was designed by the player um, to be a very, you know, to seem very much like a traditional fantasy hero like a the big friendly no nonsense like knight kind of guy but we first see him not when he was fighting uh, not you know a few years ago prior to this point in the story he had tracked down the head of this um criminal organization that had been sweeping through the land and causing all sorts of problems and blah 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 and there was a big climactic fight we don't see that at all. We see him when he is just living his day-to-day -day life in a small town and has been asked to go find a missing child. That's not his biggest story. That's not, it's not the biggest thing in his life. And it still ends up being very important to him and to the people around him without giving too much away. <laughs> What is your planning, your world building, and your lore process like? Did you kind of have it all planned from the beginning? Have you done a lot of the filling in the gaps as things have gone on? You know, kind of explain how that process has worked for you. The start of this world idea was before I was planning on making a, a podcast. It was, it was something that I was going to use for a new campaign that I was thinking about running. Never ended up doing it. But the basic premise of the setting was I want to give people full freedom to do whatever they want, but I also don't want to have to create everything. I don't I want there to be limits to what they could reasonably do. So I created a literal wall surrounding the entire the entire setting. And I was like, let's just have a wall. So that way they can go any direction. But I know, I know that there's limits to what they can, where they can go. Sandboxes still have walls, right? Exactly. Exactly. 100%. And so when I eventually decided to make this into a podcast, I took just a, a drawing of a circle and I took a pencil and I was like, let me draw in. I think, I think I chose like six or seven features. And I was like, let me just draw six or seven features onto this circle, and that will be my setting. Whenever a guest says to me, this is my basic character, and this is the sort of quest that I would like to go on, or if I have a quest in mind, whatever, I look at that wall, and I look at all those features, and I see, 
all right, can I set this at one of those pre-existing locations or do I need to add a new feature to the map? And that's what I've been doing. Every time there is a need for something new, I draw in something new and I, I try to keep those locations consistent. I, I try to let people suggest and add as much different stuff as they want. I originally, at the, at the beginning of the conception of the show, I really did not want to have churches and religion be a major part of the plot. And my first few players were like, no, 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 sir. They will be. <laughs> so uh, they very quickly became a very major thing. And that's against my wishes. <laughs> but I, I love it. I mentioned in the introduction that side character quest is one-on-one. -on -one. So you are the DM. Each week you have a guest on. The guest stories will last two to three to six episodes each-ish, depending. It, and it all kind of depends on, on the decisions they're making and kind of uh, the end of that quest that they are on. But what is the your favorite part about playing just one-on-one? -on -one? And then maybe what are some of the tricky parts about playing one-on-one? -on -one? I love unbalanced parties because it just forces people to be so much more creative in what they do, how they approach things. It forces people to be less the phrase of the murder hobo trope. People can't do that when they're by themselves because they know they will face the consequences of their actions. I also love that there are people that I've played with that I think in a party would sort of fall to the background. And would just let other people make the decision. And when I'm playing with them one-on-one, -on -one, they have to make the choice. They have to do it. Playing with people when there is not a face to the party, when there's not, not the one person who always loves to make decisions, it leads to some very thoughtful encounters that I, that I really enjoy. It's also, though, very draining uh, to do one-on-one -on -one games because people talk about the joy of letting your players talk amongst themselves. And I don't have that luxury. It is such a fun and rewarding thing when you are DMing a party of people and they just all start talking to each other about what they want to do in character or out of character when they're when you've presented a situation with where they feel like they need to talk it out. It's so fun, but it's also a time when you as the DM can take a breather and you can't do that when you're doing one on one. So I, I found out very quickly that uh, two-hour play sessions, any more than that, it's, it's a lot. That's a lot of time to be mentally turned on, going 100% ready for whatever might yes. happen. Yeah, yes, I can see that for sure. This is not about specifically playing one-on-one, -on -one, but something about the format of the show where we're following a different guest who is playing a different character each week. It means that I can hop around the world there was a there was a section of the world in SEQ called the Salton Sea. It's it's, you know, not going to go into it. It's a big it's a big wet place. The waters. <laughs> and I really wanted to explore that place. And if I had had to wait for the adventuring party to decide to go that way, that would have been terrible. It would have taken maybe years. Maybe they'd never go over the entire course of the campaign. And I would be just sitting there like, waiting. are you sure? You sure you don't want to? But because I'm playing with a new guest each, you know, not each week, but at the beginning of each quest, I'm starting with a new person. I can just put them there. And then I can just start at that location. I can start up in the north, in the mountains. I can start at the big city. I can start at the mines. I can start them wherever. And I can see the whole world. I don't have to wait for it to make sense. And that's great. How much more are you planning for this particular story that you are telling? So all of these different people are, are side characters in this giant overarching story that we, we may have some pieces of, but you know, there's <laughs> a lot of, well, you know, you could, you could make a lot of different assumptions about what's, what might be happening uh, by listening, but yeah, avoiding spoilers, what kind of end are you hoping to come to and how much more story do you feel like there is to tell before this will come to a completion? When I first started this show, I did not realistically think that I would end up making more than 10 episodes, and we're approaching 90 now. <laughs> We've been doing this show for a long time. From the very beginning, I wanted to get to an end. I wanted to have a satisfying conclusion to the story. I have 
always had a quote unquote final quest in mind from the very beginning. I could have started it years ago or I could start it years from now. The way that it's structured, I could start it whenever. And this end, this end to the story, this end to the quest, it started out as a very generic story arc, like a, a very generic kind of what you would expect from a fantasy story. And that piece, the, the framework of that is still there. But as we have gone on, new characters, new player characters have come in with new agendas and new things that they care about that has dramatically changed what that final quest will actually look like. Without spoiling too much, the goal that I have in mind for the final quest, no one knows except for me. But there is a, another thing that ties into that that everybody knows at this point. As of the last few episodes, everybody knows what that is. That was not something I had planned at the beginning, and it came purely from how multiple characters interacted with the world. Sorry for being so vague, <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's a slow burn show, and I don't want to ruin it for you guys. It's true, yeah. And obviously, if you want to know what he's alluding to, just go and listen and catch up with the rest of us, and then you'll know what he's talking about. It didn't take me too long. It took me a few weeks, but, you know, here we are. Your show is very unique, like we've talked about, the one-on-one -on -one aspect, the short story arcs aspect, and that they're all taking place in the same world that you kind of have ultimate control over. With all of this in mind, is there anything you would have changed approaching the show from the very beginning, now, knowing what you know now, or would you have just done it the same because of the things that you've learned, or a mixture of both? There's a couple of things. I think an easy answer is, the show is so close to being family friendly. Mm. We don't delve into romance um, at all in the show just because one on one romantic stuff would be weird. We don't do gore. We don't do extreme violence. So I feel like it would be it would have been so easy to just be like, all right, let's never reference drugs and alcohol. Let's never curse. Let's never do anything like that. And, you know, I, I feel like the show still ends up landing about PG-13, and I think that it's fine for anybody that's like, you know, a teen, and probably even fine for little kids if their parents are cool. Uh, <laughs> but, but it's so close to being like actually family friendly, and I feel like I, I could have just nudged it a little bit farther. I also feel like the fact that we don't have more people as regulars on the show and like a more concerted team makes everything harder because like social media, I'm the person that does that editing. I'm the person that does that research. I'm the person that does, I do all of these pieces. And if we had, if I had a larger team, that would, that would just make the whole process easier. Mm -hmm. I'm jealous of those actual plays out there that are like, one of us is a graphic designer. One of us edits. One of us does all the social medias. One of us, it's like, Oh man, that sounds really nice. That is not to discount my, a wonderful sister who draws our episode art. Um, she does a great job. And then, of course, all of the players who are amazing and give of themselves so much on the show. And one, one final thing that I wish I had been doing from the very beginning, I thought that sound design, like basic ambiance, adding basic ambiance, would be so much harder than it is. It's hard don't get me wrong. And like sometimes I will spend hours doing sound design stuff after I finish it, finish editing the show itself. But I wish that I'd been doing it from the very beginning because it just it takes the show from sounding oh, pretty good to sounding. It's just so much more enjoyable to listen to. Your mileage may vary as a listener. There's the caveat again. I lied when I said there wouldn't be any more. But for me, as a listener to my own stuff. I find it so much more enjoyable to listen back to if I have done sound design on top of the normal game talk. Yeah, there's something to be said for the immersive nature of just having those environmental sounds play in the, the town ambiance playing back uh, in the background when when your characters are interacting with, you know, wherever they might be. So it does really take the, the show to a whole new level. And I'm glad that it doesn't take too much more of your time. Well, it might take more of your time, but I'm glad it's not too difficult. 
if if I was doing the the bare bones that I started with, you know, just just adding like a pad of ambiance, that doesn't take much time at all. It's when I spend, you know, 30, 40 minutes on a single spell sound effect. That's when I'm like, oh, this <laughs> I don't need to be putting in this much work. All right, Ty. What are your parting words of wisdom and encouragement for new and aspiring DMs, old and jaded DMs, and also anyone out there who is thinking about starting a podcast or has started an actual play podcast and is looking for some tips and tricks? First, for the new DMs that are are just starting a new actual play podcast and are a little worried because they don't seem to have too many listeners, I want you to know that I was finally like six or seven months into the, into making the show, I was finally starting to get a pretty good listenership. And then my podcast host purged the bot listens. And I realized that over about six or seven months, I had amassed maybe eight listeners. So <laughs> there's a lot of room to grow. And it's okay. If, if, it, if you don't have too many listeners at the beginning, that is totally fine. Just if, if you are enjoying yourself, if you're having a good time, then that is enough. If it's enough for you, if it's not enough for you, that's also okay. You're not, you're not a failure because you don't actually like doing a podcast just for fun. That's, that's also fine. Oh man, is this more depressing than anything else? Listen, I'm doing fine now. We're doing okay. <laughs> but, but it was rough at the beginning. I am not the best world builder that I have ever listened to. I am not the best writer that I have ever listened to. I am not the best actor I have ever listened to. I, I've, I'm not the best DM that I have met, played with, heard on a show, yet people still enjoy playing the games that I run. People still enjoy listening to the show that I do. You're doing fine. <laughs> You're doing good. Focus on the things about running a game that you enjoy. So that's what I'm saying to you if you were starting a show. If you are a DM out there, if you're just getting started as a DM, if you've been DMing for a really long time, anything like that, there is advice that I would give to somebody else that is trying to make a one-player actual play show that is for publication that 100% contradicts wonderful advice that I've heard other DMs give on this show. And there is advice that you could give to somebody that's running a combat heavy game that would be terrible advice for somebody that's focused on role play. There is advice out there for any DM that would be terrible for another another DM. So try new things whenever you can. Try new game systems, try new settings, try new techniques. Whenever you can try something new, try it. Trying out 10 terrible pieces of advice is going to be better for you than only hearing a single great piece of advice. So Ty, I have loved your show and I've been looking forward to this for a long time. So number one, thank you for joining me. I'm glad we got to do this. I'm really looking forward to the end of the story arc of side character quests, whenever it might be, you better make it soon or else I will find you. What projects are you working on that you want to plug here? I run side character quest as a part of the scavengers network, uh, which is a collection of different shows where we only have one other actual play on the show. It's called a uh, myth takes that does monster of the week. Um, everybody else is, you know, we've got movie review shows. We've got improvised comedy. Um, Alabaster's haberdashery. I've been on there a couple of times. And they're all great. Check them all out. I was recently on uh, Unnatural 20s, which is a show that is D&D adjacent, I'd say, but is uh, more conversational. I also, off network, recently guested on a show called The Weird, uh, which is kind of like The X-Files, if Mulder and Scully were a couple of dinguses. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And those folks over there are currently building a game as they make the podcast, which is really fun and interesting. Uh, so check them out as well. But beyond that, yeah, just check out Side Character Quest. We've got a episode that, you know, sort of walks you through how to get started if, if you want to start. But really, you can start from the beginning or you can start at the beginning of any quest that looks interesting. If you start listening to a quest and you're like, ah, I'm not feeling this, just go on to the next one. There's something out there for you. 
you'll have a good time. Like I said, Ty, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm so glad I got to chat with you. You and I have bonded over a lot of different things. You've given me a lot of great advice over the months. I can't say years yet, but I will <laughs> be able to eventually. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. No problem. Thank you for having me. I've, like I said before, I really enjoy this show. It's a good show, making out quality stuff. So keep it up.